dedicated group. Yes. And uh, welcome to the 2013 John R. Finnegan Freedom of Information Award Ceremony. And um, I, my name is Helen Burke. I'm lucky to serve as the chair of the Minnesota Coalition on Government Information. And um, can I just say that you've got a program that uh, describes a little bit about the event, a little bit about the award. And um, I just want to mention, if I can, some of the board members that are here with me. And we are such a select group that those of you in the audience that aren't past Finnegan Award winners or current board members may well be tapped for either one of those categories in the future. So current board members, we have Jane Kirtley, Deshaun Drew, Gary Hall, Matt Ayling. Matt Ayling uh, won the uh, Finnegan Award last year. Robbie LaFleur, Art Hughes, Don Gemberling. Am I missing anybody? No. Past board members, we have uh, Julia Wallace with us. And I think that's correct. Sue Campbell. Oh, Sue Campbell, yes, of course, right there, past board member. Uh, past uh, Finnegan Award winners, we have Senator Betzold, and well, Gary, uh, many of the current board members have um, won the award, and just entering the room now, so that we can all notice his late arrival, is John Borger. Um, and I just, I don't think I really need to tell this group much about uh, freedom of information and the value that we all place on it. So I want to go ahead and just mention that we have, we're lucky to have two speakers whose work is largely uncelebrated and if not unknown. And one is our keynote um, speaker, Judge Kathleen Guerin, and the other is our Finnegan Award winner, um, Ms. Michelle Timmons, the Minnesota Reviser of Statutes, both of whom their work is largely um, unknown, but it benefits everybody, everybody that wants to have an informed democracy. Um, and without further ado, Judge Kathleen Guerin is going to give us an update on Minnesota's Cameras in the Court project. I think I'll leave it at that and let us go ahead. Thank you. I don't know why that unknown people. <laughs> Ask Governor Valenti. <laughs> still not one of my favorites, but that's fine. Okay. At any rate, I'm not going to show anything. I, it really isn't an update. I guess I'm going to give a, a, a speech on cameras in the courtroom. So, and I didn't realize it was of that much interest, but I've been being called by people who want copies even before I give it. And I said, you know, I can't skip that, you know, to be strictly keep to a script I never had in my life. But <laughs> at any rate, within the last year, WCCO television reporter Jason Duresha dealt with the good question, why don't we have cameras in the courts? That's what I want to talk about today. The question that is one that's been asked by members of the media in Minnesota for years is also becoming increasingly asked by the public as they see more and more coverage of high-profile criminal cases in other states, including venues as close to Minnesota as Wisconsin, Iowa, and North Dakota. The answer is a complicated one based on long years of practice and the unique legal culture in Minnesota. The easy answer is, our court rules don't allow easy access to the courts for cameras. Our courts have always been open to reporters and even artists who can do drawings in controversial cases. We may have got a history of case law that's ruled against judges and told them you can't close the court even for some significant matters. For years there have been rules dealing with cameras in the courts that have been promulgated by our Supreme Court. The easy answer is that the rules have made it very awkward and difficult for cameras to get into the courtrooms in Minnesota. We're presently in the middle of a pilot project that was allowed by the Supreme Court after receiving a report from a committee that was established to look into this issue. 
The pilot program expires, I believe, on October 1st. John Pistorius thinks I might be wrong, but I think it's October 1st, 1913, or 2013. When that expires, this issue will be again become a controversial one for the Supreme Court and the trial court. It was hoped by the media and many judges that the pilot project would result in more practice with having cameras in the court. That hasn't happened. Cameras have been allowed in more civil proceedings, but it's still almost impossible to get them into criminal proceedings under the present rules, including including the um, pilot project rules. The pilot project really loosened up civil, but it still requires consent of the parties in criminal matters. So the question again, why aren't there cameras in the courts in Minnesota? I'm now going to go over a number of reasons why I think that in my experience, we haven't grown as much as I wish we had in allowing cameras in the courts. And my experience is 20, 26 plus years as a trial court judge and a prosecuting attorney before that. As much as I wish, I just said that. There, I said it. I'm for cameras in the court. This is still a controversial issue among the trial court judges in our state. And there will be some that won't like the fact that I said that. Most are open to at least the discussion. I favor some limitations, which I'll talk about later, but I think the justice system would be better served by loosening up our rules regarding cameras in the courtrooms than by keeping them as limited as they are at present. I've had some personal experience with cameras in the courtroom, and it has all been positive. My most recent experience has been in the government shutdown, and I think everybody followed that. We had both still cameras and uh, television cameras in the courtroom. It was great. Well, we forget, I think most, the judge forgets about it because, especially with that case, I was so, I mean, the issues were so complex, so significant, that I looked, I saw it was stationary, and I forgot about it. I think the lawyers did, I didn't find any inappropriate behavior on the part of the lawyers, any play to the cameras, any unnecessary grandstanding. And I believe that it helped the public understand what went on. I also believe that it helped the public have more confidence, not only in the justice system, but also in our whole system of government. Although I think they became frustrated with the other two branches. I think it may also have helped put some pressure on the other two branches to resolve what turned out to be the longest state government shutdown in the history of the United States. I had experience with the canvassing board. It wasn't a courtroom experience. I was on it because I was a judge, but I wasn't a judge on it. But that, to me, was really personally informative on the importance of cameras at, at, at public matters um, for public confidence, and so the public can understand what we're going through. I had experience with phone gate. This is quite a while ago. It involved House of Representatives phone records. I let the cameras in to hear those arguments. I had experience with the first punitive damages motion involving priest sexual abuse cases. I'm not sure, that, might be, that was in the 80s, the early 80s, I think. And I let them in on the arguments about that case. It was Father Adams and them. And it was controversial when I did it, but I thought it worked out fine. So, the question repeated again, why aren't there cameras allowed in the courtroom? I'm going to give you a number of reasons, and I think it's reflective of what I said earlier. It's the unique culture, the experience of our legal system in our state. Judges are afraid, and I'm not saying that to be critical of judges. Some judges aren't comfortable with public speaking. Some worry that the media, and I, do, I worry about this too, will take a statement that, I, that they make out of context and make them look bad. Sometimes we worry that it will limit the give and take that is appropriate in some cases to bring about a just result. It will make it more difficult for juries. There's a belief that it will. Victims and other witnesses will be less willing to testify in criminal cases. County attorneys don't want it. They've opposed it again and again. Witnesses will not want to be seen as snitches. 
This is especially concerning in gang cases. It will make jury duty more difficult. They'll be nervous about whether their faces will be shown. It'll bring more publicity to a case, and some people who know they're involved in it, they're afraid they might talk to them, even if their faces aren't shown. Judges and attorneys will play to the camera. It will take more time. Other judges and or lawyers will think that you are a hot dog. I didn't know what the proper term was. Hot dog, grandstanding it, media hound, I'm not sure. But they will think you are. And we care about what other judges think of us, to be honest. Maybe we shouldn't, but we do. We have you know, a good collegial bench in Minnesota, and you don't, you, you don't want to be the one oddball. The media is so used to being told no that they've given up asking. <clears throat> That's the reason that the media should think about it. All of the things discussed above are reasons why we don't have cameras in the courtroom in Minnesota at present. None of them, in this speaker's opinion, are so impossible to deal with that Minnesota courts should not work with responsible media representatives to make our courtrooms more accessible to cameras, not only in civil matters, but also in criminal matters. To continue with the present practices that basically discourage cameras in the courtroom would be to ignore the fact that all across the United States, having cameras in the courtroom has been successful. Sure, you might be able to think of one example. I can think of an example where a judge did, quote, hot dog it in Florida. But that's a rarity. It's not the practice. It's not, not the normal. It ignores the fact that except for a few, judges have not played to the cameras. In my experience, as I said before, a judge quickly forgets the camera is even there. We become, as we should be, so involved in the dynamics of the case, in the importance of, of, of being fair, and the necessity to make rulings that we don't notice the cameras. It ignores the fact that the media has been respectful and thoughtful around the country in their decisions regarding identifying vulnerable victims and other witnesses. It ignores the fact that the media has not shown the faces of jurors. It is time to make it easier to the, for the public to follow our courts. We have hard-working judges and lawyers who care about justice in Minnesota, and they will protect litigants from unfair exposure. They will protect family law cases from having cameras where you're talking about child custody. They will protect child witnesses. They will protect jurors. They will protect, as we have a responsibility to do now, witnesses from being harassed, even by the lawyer's questioning, unfairly harassed. We will protect. I repeat, it is time. That's it. Wonderful. And I hope that we can, um, after our presentation at the award, can have time for um, an open discussion, question and answer. Yeah, I was told to leave some yes. time, so. That's wonderful. I'm more than willing to answer a question if you have one. That's wonderful. And we also, um, thanks to Joan Gilbertson of uh, WCCR TV, have a representative sample of coverage of cameras in the court. Five, five different yes. episodes. And um, so we may be able to show that as well. Uh, now we're at the point where we want to present this year's award. And may I ask um, John Finnegan uh, Sr.'s namesake, uh, John Finnegan Jr., to come up. And um, he is here. Uh, we're, uh, we regret that uh, John Finnegan Sr. Um, left us uh, a few months ago, but we are happy to have uh, his namesake here for the presentation of the award that is a legacy to and a tribute to the work that John Finnegan Sr. did to um, freedom of information in the state of Minnesota. Thanks. I don't know if you want to say that. I, I would love to. Yes, thank you very much. This is, uh, uh, a, as you know, this was a great deep lifelong passion for my father, and uh, it, uh, 
it was hard to be his uh, son and not have a lot of this sort of rub off on you in, in some way, shape, or form. Um, I'm, this is a, a, just a, the perfect way for, for, uh, to keep this legacy going. Uh, as my dad was uh, getting close to the, the end of, uh, last fall, uh, we were talking a lot about different things. He wanted to know what was I reading and that sort of stuff. And I said, well, interestingly enough, uh, Dad, I'm reading this book. It's called Why Nations Fail. And, and he said, well, tell me about that. I said, I don't think he thought he was going to have time to read that thing, so he wanted the, you know, the 25-word summary. And uh, essentially what that book is about is that the reasons nations fail, there's a whole bunch of them, but the key reason in this book is because their institutions fail to be inclusive. They fail to be transparent. They fail to be accountable. And when that happens to a nation, even as uh, with as long a history of democracy as this one, uh, the consequences are not good. And it's also why many nations in Africa, the Americas, and so forth, uh, Europe, never quite get to the point of inclusiveness. So part of that is about information. Part of it is about access to information, freedom of information, and an unfettered media to be able to report that. And I would dare say part of it is even about cameras in the courtroom. So thank you so much on behalf of uh, my dad, my mom, and, uh, and our family. Uh, this is just a tremendous way to keep his legacy alive. Thank you. And now may I ask this year's award winner, the new award winner, Michelle Timmons, to come up and um, receive her award. Michelle Timmons is the revisor of statutes, and she receives the award on behalf of her work and her leadership as the revisor of statutes to make um, the um, revisor's office be a leader, really, among uh, state legislatures in making current uh, legis legislative information available online and historical. Uh, efforts to do so. We have the statutes back to um, the beginning. Uh, we have the rules that are in the that are available online, and there's an effort to make the predecessor to the rules, the Minnesota Code uh, NCAR, I just uh, available online as well. And uh, so here we are with uh, Michelle Timmons receiving the award. Let's give her a round. Of applause. so much to the Minnesota Coalition on Government uh, Information. Uh, I'm just so honored and humbled to accept the John R. Finnegan Freedom of Information Award. Um, John R. Finnegan Sr. was a true leader and role model for freedom of government information uh, in Minnesota, and so it's just a true honor to be getting an award um, in, in his name. And thank you also to you, uh, John R. Finnegan, Jr., for taking time out of your schedule to come and present the award. I really appreciate it. Um, in accepting this award, I'm, I, I really enjoyed your remark about inclusiveness, too, because that was sort of one of the themes of what I wanted to say today, too, that um, I'm accepting this award really on behalf of the entire Office of the Revisor of Statutes. Um, it's been a real team effort uh, within the Revisor's Office um, for the Extend, the new XML-based bill drafting and legislative document drafting and publishing system, uh, the staff, so many staff in the office designed the new system, programmed it, use it, uh, even as we speak. They're using it back at the legislature where it's a very busy day today. Um, with the web, uh, so many staff have been involved in the um, almost in real time web display of documents uh, on the Minnesota legislature's website. 
and also in getting all the archival material uh, on the web. And then fundamentally, in order to have good public information, you have to start with a quality product. So the staff who are involved in all the, the legislative and administrative rule drafting, editing, and indexing are also to be thanked in this, in this team effort. Uh, but the credit really goes beyond the reviser's office, too. And certainly, um, the legislators, far-sighted legislators like Senator Betzold, who uh, recognized that that even though economic times were tough, it was important to appropriate money for a new computer system for uh, the Minnesota legislature. Uh, and there are numerous consultants who were brought on board to assist staff in all the programming. The scanning of all the archival material, there's all kinds of uh, probably people in this room who helped on that project. Um, the State Law Library and the Legislative Reference Library provided old uh, materials, old books that we then sent over to the U of M book bindery to have them carefully unbound and, uh, so that they could be scanned and digitized um, and then carefully rebound to put back in hard copy in the libraries. Um, similarly, the uh, Minnesota uh, Historical Society um, was instrumental in that they uh, uh, administer many of the legacy grants that, um, that were a source of funding for scanning these historical materials. Uh, and then there's the Uniform Electronic Legal Material Act. And little did I know that fateful day in 2007 when Barb Golden called me and said, well, I'm doing a survey for the American Association of Law Libraries, and have you ever heard or thought about authenticating your legal materials? And I said, well, I'm not doing it yet, but I thought about it. <laughs> and apparently I was one of the only people in the country who <laughs> answered that I even thought about it. So that started a whole series of uh, invitations for um, a summit at the American Association of Law Libraries um, in Chicago. And then, because I was a uniform law commissioner, we wrote a proposal to do a project to draft an act, and I ended up chairing both the study committee and the drafting committee um, on that. And, and so, um, obviously, there's a lot of people in, in the American Association of Law Libraries and the Minnesota Association of Law Libraries and the Uniform Law Commission who were instrumental in that effort. And so, um, to just conclude my remarks today, I am pleased to announce that the Minnesota version of UELMA, the Uniform Electronic Legal Material Act, um, did pass uh, the second body, uh, the House passed it, First, um, the Senate passed it on Monday. The revisor's office presented the official enrollment to the governor on Tuesday. And so I expect that it will be signed into law by the governor either later today or tomorrow at the very latest. So. <laughs> and so I think that uh, that will really set the, set the law and the parameters for the next stage, uh, which is to really authenticate this legal material and make sure that it's preserved and accessible for future generations. And again, thank you so much. that would help in having the conversation um, represented on uh, by the uptakes filming. So if you don't mind, I'm going to get those um, mics and, and using that because I, I think this will be worth um, uh, having it well known, what we're talking about. So 
Um, any questions or comments that you want to direct, Matt? I'm going to get the. No, wait for the mic. single camera pool coverage or multiple cameras at a time in your experiences and which would you uh, recommend if a uh, rule making were promulgated going forward? I, I think I'm trying to remember if I've experienced more than one camera. I think uh, because even before the rule required a single stationary, the rules required a single stationary camera, I believe the first time I did it on that priest abuse case motion, I insisted that it be one camera. I, I mean, logistically, I can't see it. You can't have people moving around the court room. A, a tiny bit for the media. I think in the um, in the shutdown case, there was a newspaper reporter, a Star Tribune, not reporter, photographer, and he moved very slightly. But I think we talked about it ahead of time. The television camera, there's no way it can move around. I, I can tell you, I, I have had the difference in the shutdown. It did. They were able to come running up the side. I was the one on the far, on the side where the cameras could run up. So my hands are shown. The famous picture where I look like this. <laughs> I suppose I could say that's a bad. <laughs> no, it is a little distracting to have the television cameras just moving and moving. It would be distracting for um, to have uh, any cameras, uh, you know, still photography also. The, the media has been great about it, though. And the stationary, I can tell you, you just forget about it. And I think the lawyers do, too. It really doesn't make a big difference. I wish I could convince all judges. I don't have to, I don't have to convince all judges of that, but you know, I think judges try it. <laughs> Any other questions for me? And then I could ask Michelle. Yeah. The gentleman back there. Judge, do you see a day when citizens will be able to record their own uh, trials? The question was, do you see a day when citizens will be able to record their own trials? I doubt it. Not in my lifetime. You know, I don't, you know, right now the rules are pretty strict against it. There has to be an official record. There has to be a person who, under oath, that's our, our court reporter, some of them are electronic court reporters, they, somebody has to be responsible and certify that this is the official record. I don't see it. I might be short-sighted. I just really don't see it. That could be distracting, too, if a lot of people are trying to do that. There's another question? Yeah, you said that um, repeated delineation and many other examples of it working well elsewhere, and yet we still haven't been able to get over the hump here in Minnesota. So what do you think it's going to take ultimately? It's not that we don't have the examples. It's not that both in Minnesota and beyond. It's just that people don't seem to want it in their courtroom. They just don't seem to want it in their courtroom. They don't have to allow it. And how do you get beyond that reality? Like a lot of things in the law, I and mean, the law is kind of a conservative type of area. I mean, conservative, I don't mean politically, but I mean, you know, the history of the law has worked pretty well in the United States. You know? I mean, the law are, are showing respect and respect for our Constitution, for the laws, for the separation of powers. We don't want to change too quickly. So that's been part of the resistance is due to that. One of the answers is time. I see it changing right now. Would I have said what I said five, uh, 10 years ago? No, I would have been thinking a little bit, but I wasn't as strong on it as I am now. Uh, we have judges who are more used to all kinds of media, all kinds of electronic. You know, there's going to be some problems. I mean, what's the news media? Any little blogger? I mean, that's going to be an issue. You know, and that's, that's an issue for, for other governmental uh, other areas of government and the other branches of government too. But um, I think time is one thing. I think another thing is that the public wants it more and more. And three, and this is where I'm going to put it on, on the media, the media needs to keep asking and keep asking and keep asking. They aren't asking. A lot of media has given up. So 
So I think, I, I know there's a number of other judges in the state who, who follow the way, believe what I believe. I mean, Kevin Burke is one. I mean, he's publicly spoken in favor of cameras in the courts. There are judges who have agreed to have cameras in the courts. Last night I, I ran into a, one of our chief judges from another district, and he told me when he was a public defender years ago, and I, I, this is in the 80s, there was a murder trial in western Minnesota, it must have been in the Detroit Lakes area, where a, there was a camera in the courtroom for the whole murder trial. I don't even remember that. It didn't get much publicity. It wasn't, I don't think it was a TV camera, but it was a, a newspaper camera during the whole trial. There have been examples. They haven't spread around enough. I, I, we're, I see it changing. I think it's going to start. The acceleration of change is going to increase. And it's going to be public pressure, media pressure, uh, more willingness by judges. Yes? Uh, Judge Garrett, you mentioned uh, Judge Burke. He had one of the last initiatives to get cameras in the court, and it was a different approach where they were looking for a majority of the district court chief judges to vote for their districts to bring cameras in the court. And he, he had a majority vote up until the one swing vote moved. Um, but it was right at the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, which, which influenced the judge's decision. But my question is, is that a viable path, or is this something the Supreme Court's going to have to decide? What, what way is this going to come about if, if you think, in fact, we are going to have cameras in the court? Ultimately, it's the Supreme Court. The conference, or not conference, the Judicial Council can deal with that as a policy issue. But, you know, the Supreme Court has the ultimate decision-making ability. Um, you know, I was a chief judge for four years, and uh, I think I might have been blonde before that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I guess I'm not now, but uh, <laughs> I think I call it Medicare blog now. Um, but as a chief judge, you can't lead where people are not willing to follow. I don't know that you would get that vote. It's being discussed in the districts. It's being discussed by judges. It's being discussed at our statewide meetings. All I can say is I think that that the pace of that discussion will accelerate, and I think it will ultimately lead to there being more cameras in the courtroom. But if you want to say, if, if I'm the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court wants to thrust it upon the trial courts before they're ready, it, it, I'm not going to say it could be ugly. We will follow the rules of the Supreme Court. We will follow the orders of the Supreme Court. But it will be better if the, accelerate, if the discussion is accelerated and we come to it. It will be best that way, but there needs to be both a nudging and an increase in discussion and education. Mr. Castaros wanted to say something. He's our yeah. public relations director. Did you move down? Yeah. Okay. Um, Here, let me. Oh. Get on the microphone. Well, I just wanted to mention. Um, thank you, Judge Garen. Um, you know, my experience has been that uh, there are many judges who would be willing to do this, there but are increasing but numbers. The rules right now require both parties. And the experience I've had just in the time I've been here is most of the time the veto comes from one of the parties. So I would say advocates really need to be talking to county attorneys who vigorously oppose this and, and uh, victim advocates groups to try to help them uh, feel less threatened by it or something because um, I know many judges that over the years would have allowed it in a particular case but one of the parties said no. There have been a number of other times where I would have allowed it, including in criminal, but one side or the other opposed it. Sometimes it's the defendant and their attorney has to follow what they want. Frequently it's the county attorney. Yeah, John's right. Probably, he raises a good point. It may be we might have reached the point, there hasn't been any vote, but where judges are more willing than other groups. Judge, thank you. Um, uh, 35 years ago, the Supreme Court also had a task force, and as a law student, I attended all of them, and most of the people who got on the task force were about to determine to make sure this never happened, and including Ramsey County Judges Siegel and uh, Otis Godfrey. They wanted to make sure that this it never got done. But the Supreme Court was still willing to let it go along, and ultimately the Bar Association got involved. I chaired a committee of the Bar Association, but the point has been made. 
Uh, as long as it was optional, it was never going to happen because time and time again, something was always going to veto it. So I think as long as the Supreme Court allows it to be optional, we'll never see it. So I think at some point, we, and you're right, we, they may not be ready yet, but at some point you're going to have to say this is going to be the rule and let it go from there. Well, I think the first step might be to not allow a party to veto it. And that's kind of, it's, what I'm saying is very controversial. I and mean, the county attorneys would be, and some victims groups, and, and maybe some defense attorneys would have a, would not be happy with what I've said today. Um, and it's just not a matter of vetoing it, but they would have to put in some good reason. Uh, if they have a good reason, the judge can exercise. Right, right. I mean, there, you have to give them, always a judge would want to give them a chance. There may be a situation where a witness who wants to testify is threatened with death and has to be protected. You know, that, that's happened. I've seen those trials. I've had those trials. And I would, I don't care what, I would not let a camera show that person's face. Uh, Ms. Timmons, I do have a question for you. Um, uh, the Uniform Act and the talk about authentication and security. Am I, am I, am I uh, um, Are there particular procedures that you have in mind for that? Uh, how, how do you secure authentication and uh, making sure nobody's hacking into the official government websites um, or guarding them against electromagnetic pulses? Yes. <laughs> um, the question was really about um, how you do authentication and what sorts of security measures you can take. And of course, you know, I don't know that anything is 100% perfect, and it's a very dynamic area, which is why in the Uniform Act, we didn't specify particular methods for authentication, we specified the outcome that the user, the person who's viewing the legal material on the screen has to have a tool or some sort of a method to determine that what they're seeing is the official legal material that was published by the official publisher. So we used an outcomes-based approach to allow for technology growth. So that's one answer, I think. Then secondly, how are we going to do it um, in Minnesota um, by January 1 of 2015 when the act uh, is effective, assuming the governor signs it today or tomorrow? Um, we have developed a, uh, a fairly homegrown, um, no cost for outside software, no additional hardware uh, system using hash algorithms, which are really, uh, hash algorithms were really designed in the infancy of uh, the web when uh, people didn't necessarily know if they got the whole document uh, when something came over the web. So computer scientists designed a way to give each document a unique hash algorithm, which is a big long 64 character number and letter. A great big string of digits to really bear and match that up on both ends, both the publishing end and the receiving end, to make sure that you got everything uh, that was sent over over the transmission. And so the revisor's office already has a beta version of the administrative rules. Um, that you can, uh, you can find on our website and actually see what we're proposing to do for all the legal materials. And you, you have to download the PDF of what you want to authenticate. And then there's a tool on the website you can access by clicking and following the prompts. And you, what, what it's doing is the computer reads the hash value on the PDF that you downloaded and they match it up with the hash value that's in the original document that's behind the firewall and on the revisor's servers. And if that matches, you will get a nice green message that says, yep, this is an official document from the revisor's office and here's what it is. Um, and if, and if, it's, if the one that's on your 
um, that you downloaded has been altered in any way, and we've tested it with, you know, taking out a period or something like that, and it's even something very minor, you will get a red message that says this is not an official document. So um, there are other commercial software methods, most of which use some sort of a hash matching um, process under the covers. So, yes? Um. I'm wondering if that same process could apply outside of the revisor's office. And in particular, I'm wondering if that process could be applied to court forms for self-help litigants or self-represented litigants so that materials on the court website could be authenticated. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking is that I think in the state of Montana, mm -hmm. the forms were pirated by another company and for the unknown, unknowing public, they were being sold at about $900 for a divorce packet. So if there were some way for a consumer to know that state government court forms were authenticated, that might be very helpful. Uh, yes, the question was about could this method be utilized by other governmental branches and for other documents? Absolutely, yes. And we've also, the revisor's office has done some white papers that explain the method that we're using, and that's available in addition to the actual beta version. So, and I actually have been working uh, with the judicial branch to talk about authentication of their documents. The other thing that our solution does that maybe is a little different from the Adobe authentication system that you'll see if you um, are looking for federal government data, you'll see that nice blue eagle and you'll get a uh, in the blue banner uh, across the top of the page, it will say this is official uh, U.S. government um, data. Um, what, um, what we can do because of that independent hash uh, matching that we're using, say somebody, um, say you got the, a PDF of something that purported to be a session law or a statute from a friend. Well, you could download that PDF that you got from the friend into your, into your files and then go to the revisor's website and run the hash match on that to see if it is the same as an official version that we've published or not. So one of the good things, even though it's maybe a little, little yes, less user-friendly than the commercially available Adobe system, what we've developed has the has the benefit of being portable. So Judge Kieran. I, yes. I remember <laughs> our discussions in the court rules of access to records, finding out that head of the county is actually using cameras in his courtrooms to record the proceedings, but the cameras are controlled by the judiciary, not by the public. Do you see any of that expanding across the state? It may be at some time the official record is kept that way, just as some depositions are. It, that could be, but again, so it could. I don't think it's going to happen real fast because right now our energy and our both person resources and um, financial resources are, are really focusing on the e-filing and going more the e-court project. So I don't think it's going to happen soon, but I, it, in the future, it's something that I'm certain would be looked into. Yeah. yeah. Well, some of us always thought that that might be a way to solve the question of cameras in the courtroom. Could be, depending on how good it is. You know, yeah. and then it's another thing. I mean, there's all kinds of other issues. Some court was really, you know, the, the rewiring and everything that would happen. And I didn't realize, I don't know where Hennepin's doing it, but it's interesting. I think it's court smart probably. We have some court smart, but it's not really a good video record, it's an audio. Yeah, yeah. it's audio. Yeah. Audio. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions for me? I've been hearing this at <laughs> Actually, um, it's a crazy weekend.
taught to a law school class, and then I do have a couple of hearings later this afternoon. Um, Mr. Finnegan, you know, I knew your dad. Not well, but I remember meeting him a number of times. He was just a delightful man. And, you know, gosh, how would I know of being Irish Catholic and from St. Paul? <laughs> Uh, it beats me. <laughs> uh, are there any states that are doing cameras in the courtroom the right way? I haven't seen a lot of states that are doing it the wrong way, and there's a lot of states that are doing it. Are, are there states that you would say are doing it way better than Minnesota? I don't know enough. Good... I don't know enough. I, I, I know that the committee that was put together did have some judges. I know from Wisconsin and some other states come and talk about their experience and what was working well. And given the past way the judiciary has operated, if we do, when we do, not yet, when we expand, they're going to do it by finding, by benefiting from the, the problems other states had and have corrected. We always do it. We always look into that. Thanks very much for attending today's event. Uh, again, congratulations to Michelle Timmons, and thank you very much, Judge Heron. Wonderful. <laughs>